Walt was at it again. Needing a follow-up to Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, he needed a new story just as compelling, even more so. The journey into the making of Pinocchio, coming up. Hey animation fans, Animator Talk here to celebrate the art of animation and its contribution to entertainment of yesterday, today, and into the future. While in the final months of production on Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, Walt searched and searched for his next film idea. Even though Snow White was, you know, the biggest gamble of his career and his life, Walt kept moving forward, looking for his follow-up to this film. Now, Roy was a little skeptical as Snow White was still in production. Hollywood referred to this project as Disney's Folly, and he wasn't eager to begin production on a second film until he knew that they were on to something. But Walt didn't concern himself with all the naysayers and what they were blabbing about. He knew he was on to something, and he knew that they'd love his films. Walt's story team was attempting a great follow-up to this film. When Peter Pan and Beauty and the Beast were failing to develop story-wise, they were shelved for future projects. Bambi was further along, so that was put into production. Walt had a vision for Bambi. It would stay true to the original source material, and he was looking for a very natural, realistic look to this film. Walt set up art classes and brought instructors in and brought in live deer and other animals to show them how to draw them realistically. The artist needed more time to prepare for the project. So one morning, animator Norm Ferguson visited Walt's office with a copy of an Italian storybook, The Adventures of Pinocchio. Walt read it and immediately knew this was exactly the story he was looking for. The story had its challenges. Pinocchio wasn't a very likable character. He was written as a very rude, unfeeling little brat of a character who refuses to learn from his mistakes. When writing their adaptation, in order for the story to be compelling, they would need to recreate Pinocchio from the inside out. The story team was still working hard on crafting a story where an audience would actually care about this little snot of a living puppet. This crass little wooden boy jumping from interaction to interaction, from one unsavory character to another. A little wooden boy. <laughs> now who a, a wooden boy? <laughs> and failing to live up to his end of the bargain with the Blue Fairy. Pinocchio would need a positive influence, someone to communicate with and who the audience would engage with. There was one character in the book who was a positive force for change, a small cricket in which he meets briefly before stepping on him and killing him. Now, I read this book many, many years ago, and I don't quite remember if Pinocchio stepping on Jiminy was an accident or on purpose. I'd like to think it was an accident. Did he do it on purpose? Little brat probably didn't like being critiqued and offed him. He threw a hammer, striking Jiminy and killing him. Let me know in the comments what your opinion is of that. While the story team was working out all of their issues with the film, the artists were coming up with their character designs. Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson were working out a character design for Pinocchio. Initial sketches of Pinocchio were drawn very wooden looking. Long, pointed nose, exposed wooden features, and a coned hat. Walt wasn't thrilled with the look. They would end up collaborating with the great Freddie Moore, making him look more appealing. Milt Call saw what they were working on and decided they were going about it all wrong. They were focusing too hard on keeping him looking wooden. Milt would take the designs and make him more childlike. He felt it was more important to make him appealing first. His exposed arms and legs would be drawn cubed and have exposed hinges to remind the audience that he was still in fact a puppet. Frank and Ollie would remain on Milt's Pinocchio animation team and would end up animating some of the most memorable scenes. My favorite one comes to mind when Geppetto was first trying out his new creation. Not only did Frank have to animate Geppetto dancing around the room controlling a marionette, 
but the way Frank animated this still lifeless puppet, being suspended by strings. It showed you just how much the puppet weighed, and it wouldn't just dangle from the strings, but it swayed and showed all the centripetal forces in motion. It remains as one of my favorite examples of animation to this day. In deciding Pinocchio needed someone to converse with, learn lessons from, and become a better person as a result of, they decided to expand Jiminy Cricket's role. In designing Jiminy Cricket, the design team drew up all kinds of different renditions of what they felt he should look like. Being a cricket, the team drew several different versions involving actual cricket anatomy. The long thorax and the spindly legs kept design attempt after attempt looking quite unappealing. Being it was Ward's character to supervise and animate, and knowing his character was going to survive the entire film, unlike the book it was based, he decided to keep Jiminy a humanoid character. He designed the cricket to have human anatomy. His face would be largely a caricature of Cliff Edwards, the actor who voiced him. When questioned on his final design, resembling a cricket, Ward joked, Jiminy was a cricket because we called him a cricket. That's pretty swell. Art Babbitt would largely be responsible for the design of Geppetto. The father figure and toy maker who would create Pinocchio needed a lovable, compelling design. His designs originally hugged too closely to the designs of the dwarf Doc. It was decided to model him after the voice actor Christian Rubb. Babbitt would supervise the animation of the character with such care and attention to detail. Once he was done with his scenes, I couldn't help but love this character and what he was looking for out of life. Jack Campbell would have the thankless task of animating the Blue Fairy. Having to animate such beautifully radiant characters like this is no easy feat. And he pulled out all the stops to convey this character. Not only did his woman look like a cover model, but she moved with such grace. The costume of the blue gown that trailed with a train and her transparent fabrics of her sleeves were gorgeously animated. But they also faded in and out and sparkled and shimmered with Disney magic. All of those effects animated to pull off how magical she was. Man, and this was just their second animated feature. Genius. Bill Tightla, coming fresh off of the Snow White animation team, began designing and animating the brilliant Stromboli. His bombastic design and execution while playing a flamboyant character was enough to keep my head covered under the blankets as a kid. And speaking of genius animation, Wolfgang Reitherman would be responsible for animating Monster of the Whale. Never had I ever seen another example of such ferocity coming from a pencil. Eric Larson would steal every scene when he would animate his goldfish Cleo or his kitten Figaro when they would come on to screen. And animating the character that can go from levity to horror in a snap, Freddie Moore would animate the character of Lampwick. He played Lampy with such attitude that I mean, you would expect that from a loud mouth in the back of the classroom as a kid. But once he begins that transformation to Donkey, well, let's just say I used to cover my ears and shut my eyes good and tight to avoid nightmares as a kid. Exquisitely done. After the success of Snow White, Walt wanted celebrities cast in this feature. Cliff Edwards was first cast as Jiminy Cricket. He was largely known on vaudeville as Ukulele Ike and Walt knew he was the perfect person to bring life into this role. Edwards not only provided a lovable character voice with good moral high ground, but he performed two of the most memorable songs in film history, one of which became the company's anthem. One upon a star. Walt rejected any ideas of casting an adult in the role of Pinocchio. He cast 11-year-old Dickie Jones in the title role after seeing him in Frank Capra's Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. His youthful voice had an innocence that Walt was looking for. He would be one of the easier child actors to work with in the booth. Christian Rubb was cast as Geppetto. The Austrian actor was able to allow his natural accent to shine through to lend some authenticity to his character. Evelyn Venable would not only provide the voice, but both 
Evelyn and Christian would provide live-action reference for the animation team. Comedian Walter Catlett lent his performance skills as J. Worthington Fowlfellow, a.k.a. Honest John. An 18-year-old Frank Darrow would provide the voice of the horrible example Lampwick. Not only did Charles Juddles play boisterous puppet master Stromboli, but he also voiced the terrifying coachman who lures misbehaving boys to Pleasure Island. They never come back as boys. Not dark at all. Walt knew very well that the music was a key element to his films that resonated with the audience. It was vital. He got his songwriting team of Lee Harlan, Paul Smith, and Frank Churchill back to work to pen five original songs for this film. Once the animation team was back on track, this film seemed to move along just fine, though the budget would be stretched, and then forgotten about. In looking to bring more depth and reality to the opening of the film, Walt worked with the layout team to devise a great shot, utilizing the multiplane camera to move the camera through the village and land on Geppetto's toy store front. It was a beautiful shot, an achievement in animation for sure, but the shot was a very expensive one, costing far more than Walt had anticipated. Once Roy discovered how much budget was used on this shot, he promised Roy he would use this camera rig much more sparingly on future projects. Oh, hey, did you know? Check it out. The Great Mel Blanc. Looney Tunes' Great Mel Blanc was cast as Gideon, the sidekick to Honest John in the film. This was a second attempt to cast him after his role of Dopey became mute. And this is Dopey. He don't talk none. <laughs> when the film evolved and Gideon became a pantomime character as well, they decided they enjoyed Mel's comedically provided character hiccup so much that they kept him in the film. This would be the one and only Disney project to include Mel's voice until Who Framed Roger Rabbit in 1988. Revitalizing Negative Impressions The film would be given a painstaking, complete restoration in 1992. Digitally cleaning up negatives frame by frame, removing old dirt, scratches, and enhanced all the colors, not to mention revitalizing the often distorted soundtrack. It was given another restoration pass in 2009, giving us the pristine version that we enjoy on digital today. The Secret Death Sentence While Honest John tricks Pinocchio into going to Pleasure Island, John gives him a ticket, a card, an ace of spades. In popular folklore, the ace of spades is also known as the death card. A Duck Played the Cat Figaro's vocal effects were voiced by the studio favorite Clarence Nash. If that name sounds familiar to you, he's also famous for providing the voice of Donald Duck. Pinocchio was released in New York City at the Center Theater in Rockefeller Center on February 7, 1940. The critics at the New York Times wrote, Pinocchio is here at last, is every bit as fine as we had prayed it would be, if not finer and that it is as gay and clever and delightful a fantasy as any well-behaved youngster or jaded oldster could hope to see. Ah, the 1940s. Now, I would love to share with you that Pinocchio was a box office success, but I'd be lying. This film's budget finished off at $2.6 million, which was twice the cost of Snow White. The film would only take in $1.4, $1.9 million. Now, its failure was largely blamed on World War II and cutting off overseas ticket sales and moviegoers, but Joe Grant would recall Walt being extremely depressed over the box office returns, and the film's distributor, RKO, would take a loss of $94,000. It was largely thanks to the reissues of the films where Pinocchio would finally be successful. In 1985, Pinocchio would be released on home video, Disney would successfully sell about 150,000 videotapes that year at a staggering $80 a copy. 
Good piece of wood, too. My mother picked up our copy two years later, but home video prices wouldn't drop to reasonable prices for another five years or so. Thanks, Mom. Sorry. Man, it's gross to think that they could gouge us for $80 to $100 for a videotape in the mid to late 80s, where we can now download the same film for $10, $20 on iTunes today. It's funny to think today that this film would have had any trouble coming together, or even more unthinkable, that it wasn't more successful in its initial run. While this film had many, many dark elements in it, they're very easily overlooked with the heart, the beauty, and the magic in the rest of it. There's no wonder how Pinocchio is as celebrated a classic as it is today. The film that was dedicated for anyone who had ever wished on a star. If you like videos like this, I have a growing playlist that grows every week. If you know of somebody who would enjoy content like this, please share my channel with them. We look to expand this community. I have big plans for the future of this channel, so please spread the word for me. Thank you so much, and until next time, you keep moving forward.